About 11 years ago, when I was a poor youth pastor and needed to work multiple jobs, um, I went through a few before one stuck. I started off with the company selling life insurance that lasted a few weeks, so I kind of just realized I couldn't be the employee they wanted. Um, then I ended up working at a school for young adults with special needs, and I was a job coach there. And um, that was a really good place to be. Um, but that eventually led to a job at a nursing home in an activities department, which basically means I played a lot of bingo. And so uh, you can go ahead and go ahead. And, that. and so with that, um, don't let those smiles fool you. Um, don't get me wrong. If you want fanfare or ancient Near Eastern politics, or if you want drama, intrigue, plot twists, uh, complex politics, risk of life or limb, backdoor deals, or simply a good rush of adrenaline, bingo at a nursing home is right for you. So they called me the kid. I was one of the few staff members that the residents took the time to nickname. My job was to be fun and to be a companion for them. Residents would sit in their doorway and uh, watch, uh, and people watch kind of as people would go by. This would give them something to do. Uh, so, uh, but people watching would give, it would give them something to do throughout their day. So I'd walk down the hall and I'd give people high fives as I went by. And uh, so I helped run activity, activities. I led bingo. I held Bible studies when volunteers weren't available. And then I led bingo. If a patient did not have visitors, or if they didn't have enough visitors, they earned a spot on my list to see them individually. Um, there were also, um, I, I noticed a lot of residents who used to read the Bible, they used to do their devotions and kind of have this daily walk with God, but they were no longer able to because of macular degeneration or something like that. Um, and so for, for these people then, I bought um, a Bible in super giant print. If you ever saw a Bible in super giant print, uh, I called it my thumping Bible because you know, it, just, it had authority to it. And, um, but that, that was something where I could then come alongside somebody and they can continue their devotions and things like that. And so this was kind of my job then at the nursing home. But if I was to be honest, um, when I was in high school and then in college and planning out my future, it was never really my goal to be an activities assistant at a nursing home. It especially wasn't my goal to uh, work a full-time job so I could be a youth pastor part-time. But there I was. Uh, little did I know, though, at the time, um, in that moment, um, God would and was using those experiences to point my life in a certain direction. And he allowed me to gain life experience and to be faithful in that context as he was preparing me to be faithful in the next. And so, uh, looking to our text for the day that Pastor Bryce read, and you did a pretty good job with the names, by the way, so thank you. Uh, Nehemiah was somebody who started off with an interesting job. He was born into captivity, and eventually he worked his way up to being the cupbearer for the king, typically a prestigious position that required trust. Um, however, this job was not always uh, what it sounded like or what it kind of cracked up to be. Um, it didn't always live up to the hype. Uh, he was basically there to take a sip for the king uh, in case someone was trying to poison the king. And so his dad got assassinated and his son got assassinated. So it was kind of like a, a hard job to have. And uh, some kings were known to have their, um, their cooks, children as the taste testers or the cupbearers and whatnot. So there's a lot of heaviness that comes with this. But if you have this job, you're typically somebody who's trusted, who has the ear of the king. But what we found um, in, in going through the book of Nehemiah so far is that God used that time in Nehemiah's life for this greater purpose of then building the wall. If he was never born into captivity, he would have never been the king's cupbearer. And if he was never the king's cupbearer, he would have never been able to lead his people in rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. So those moments of disappointment, those moments of, God, what are you doing? God was then using for something greater. So again, as we get into our, our text today in chapter 6, we see the same old characters are up to it again, plotting against Nehemiah. However, they're stepping up their game now, um, and they needed to because the job was almost done. The project was almost finished. So they invited him to talk in the plains of Ono. And so if you're ever asked to go somewhere uh, called Ono, just don't do it. It's, it's kind of like... Uh, um, flying in a plane that says, you know, uh, paperweight or something like that. Just take, take the advice of the name. Don't do it. But Nehemiah showed discernment, and he didn't fall for it. So four times they did this, and um, four times. How many times in our lives do we just give in because we feel beaten down? Fine, I'll do it. Just don't ask anymore. So whether it's your kids or a boss or a friend or somebody else, the ask could be simple. It could be something you just don't feel like doing, or it could be wrong. If we're all honest, we've all perhaps given in or bent at some point. 
But Nehemiah here in this instance, he stays committed. He knew who he was up against, and it was the same old people, but they were now up to something new. They were stepping up their game. So uh, Sanballat, um, uh, he was the leader of this crew. And by the way, the, 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 the people that are mentioned here, they're um, people groups in the area that have Jerusalem surrounded. And so Nehemiah is feeling the pressure here. He doesn't have a way out. The only way out points to the Jordan River, and you're kind of stuck there most of the year. But so Sanballat, he doubles down, and then he, he, after these four times, he then writes a letter to, ne- to Nehemiah himself. But he betrays his, his intentions in the letter with a threat of an unsealed letter. Um, and so this unsealed letter would eventually have gotten to the king. And some of you might be thinking, no, no, don't write me a letter. You know, it's kind of, what's the big deal with that? Um, but it wasn't just that he wasn't willing to, to lick the envelope. Um, 2,500 years ago, the post office did things differently. An official would typically seal a letter with an official or royal seal to validate the letter as original and then to keep other people from opening it. Because if you broke the seal and you weren't allowed to, something on you would get broken. And so it was kind of a way for security. But so he's, signed, he's uh, sending an unsealed uh, letter uh, because he wanted others to read it then. So today this might be like writing an open letter to someone and then posting it all over the internet or reading portions of it out loud or as a reel on TikTok or something like that. It would have had some hot takes that caused others to, to get angry with Nehemiah. Either others would then attack him in the name of the king, or a movement might then start against Nehemiah that may be too powerful by the time the letter gets to the king, putting the king in this delicate political situation to where he would possibly have to then recall Nehemiah, thus ending the project. And so the goal here was to um, continue to put Nehemiah and his people in danger. These satraps or the vassal kingdoms, these were kind of the, um, so they didn't have states, they had satraps or satraps, and then vassal kingdoms. And um, uh, they were kind of all around then, and that's what the um, empire was then um, broken up into. So Persia was the newest power on the block, and um, Artaxerxes, the, the emperor or the king, um, he may have had the motivation then to rebuild Jerusalem as a fortification to keep the region in check. We don't know for sure his reasonings, but we know that his reasonings then fell into God's purposes. And so God was able to move international politics for the benefit of his people. And so I'm then able to often remind myself in looking at stories like this, if God can handle that, if God can handle what's going on worldwide and all these complex situations, God can handle what's going on in my life as well. So, So these satraps or these vassal kingdoms, they might fight from time to time. And the king may or may not get involved. It would kind of depend. So I want to imagine, I want you to imagine for a moment, uh, it might be easy for a few of you, to think of it as your parents, and you're on a long road trip. All you want to go, all you want to do is to get there and have a peaceful ride. And my mom's here, so she can kind of relate to this a little bit. Uh, But if you have, um, let's say you have three kids and they're in the back seat, they're all screaming, the dog is barking, something smells, and no, you're not there yet. And then it starts, stop touching me. I'm not touching you. Mom, he's touching me. Mom, she won't stay on her side of the car. And you say, don't make me pull the car over. And so things are starting to get serious. But then it continues. And you're tired of the fighting and the screaming and on this nice family vacation where everyone's supposed to enjoy it. And so finally, you just turn the radio up or something and you let the kind of things just figure themselves out. But as long as you get to your destination, you're okay because you've had enough and we're getting to where we need to go. But then somebody goes too far, then you actually then have to pull the car over, and nobody's happy. So these empires often um, would allow these minor disputes to then figure themselves out as long as they didn't get too big. So just because you were a client of the king didn't mean that you were necessarily safe. It kind of just depended on how things were going, I guess. Uh, So Nehemiah then, in this case, was actually kind of in danger. So Sam Blatt, he was stirring things up. Um, They've done this before. They've already sent a letter to the king years in the past, and that almost worked, but now they're doing something different with going to the vassal kingdoms and the areas around Jerusalem. And with this open letter to the king, they would have reason to um, back up or justify themselves when the king was finally um, willing to pull the car over. Um, But Nehemiah, he, um, he slows down, he takes a minute, and he doesn't fall for it. Again, he's surrounded on all sides, Uh, But he's grown accustomed to this. It's kind of just like another day, he puts the goggles on, he's ready to go. And he had a method for getting through it. So when you're pressed in all sides, and it's the same situation, or the same people, um, and it's happening again and again, and it's just consistent, and it's beating you down, 
uh, someone's writing a letter for the fourth time, what do you do? When you face overwhelming odds in this way, what do you do? Where do you go? Uh, who do you go to? From what we see in the text here today, this is what Nehemiah did. And I, I kind of outlined three things. And these aren't in any particular order. They're just kind of how they appeared in the text. He stayed rooted in his purpose from God. Build the wall. He went to God in prayer as a source of strength. Strength in my hands. And he trusted God with the outcome. Remember them. And so in going back to my time in the nursing home, uh, another job function I had was to take orders for lunch or for dinner for the residents. I would work with the food services staff, and I would take orders to help pass out uh, lunch or dinner. After dinner, food services, then they had to go around and take surveys to ask people how the food was. And this one person started to suggest that um, I should then do the survey since I'm already walking around. In other words, she wanted me to do her job for her. Um, I ended up declining because I had my own work to do. But she kept suggesting this, and what accused me then, she kind of started to step it up. She would call me lazy and things like that because I didn't want her to do her job. Like, she didn't recognize the disconnect there. Uh, but I just reminded her that we both had our own work to do. Um, a couple weeks later, though, I noticed that my boss and other managers were kind of lingering and hangering, hanging around. Um, like, I always had a shadow kind of throughout my day, whether it's going to this activity or working with this person or being at this meal. Um, and it turns out that I was being investigated because of an anonymous complaint that I was kind of being lazy and sat around and wasn't doing my job. So the same food service person uh, who was trying to get me to do her work then complained about me and started rumors to other colleagues and then went above me and went to my bosses as well and kind of then said the same things. Um, and, and basically she didn't like how um, I wasn't doing her job. She didn't like how I was doing my job. She didn't like my reputation or my relationship with the other staff members or the residents. So the next day, kind of when this happened or when I figured this out, it was a little awkward at work, honestly. Um, then a week or so later, my boss informed me that there was an anonymous accusation against me, but that she and the other management, uh, they didn't have any concerns about my performance. So in other words, I was investigated, but they, I was caught being good. That's always a good thing to do, to be caught being good. Um, but uh, also, that's because I, I stayed consistent. My, my purpose there was to fulfill this responsibility, this job, and so that's what I stuck with. So thankfully, things, again, turned out in my favor. But when things like this happen, it might be on a small scale or it might be on a bigger scale, what, what do we do? Again, I recommend that we consider Nehemiah and what he did, um, which, again, was to stay rooted. He stayed rooted in his purpose uh, from God. Um, he went to God in prayer, and he trusted God with the outcome. So now you could say, shouldn't you pray first? And to uh, that I would say, well, obviously, right? We should pray first. We should pray every single day. In fact, pray without ceasing. Um, and so this list, again, doesn't have to be in any specific order. You're probably actually going to be doing them all at the same time. It's just I can't talk about them all at the same time. And so we're going to follow the order of the text. Um, but again, any one could be done first. So thinking of his purpose then, by now the wall had been constructed, but the finishing touches were still left. So the doors and the gates still needed to go up. So the wall was constructed, but the doors and the gates still had to go up. It's kind of like if your house is kind of like mine, where you have walls in your house uh, and windows, but then your kids always leave the doors open, and you're kind of then cooling the outside. Um, the, the, the doors defeat the purpose of the walls if they're left open all the time. And so this was the finishing touches that Nehemiah then had to uh, take care of. He still had work to do. And because of this, Nehemiah and his people then were still vulnerable because people could obviously still get in. The city wasn't safe yet. But with pressure mounting, he kept in mind what he was there for and what God had for him to do. In verse 3, we, we read, I'm carrying on a great project. So that's Nehemiah talking. And then in verse 4, we find that this was his response four times when others were trying to distract him. So he, he kept focused and he stayed, he stayed rooted in his purpose. So when any form of temptation comes our way, or um, what we want to do is we want to remember who and whose we are in Christ. That's key. If you ever lose track of yourself, or let's say you're Nehemiah, but you kind of give in and you go to the plane of Ono, or something like that, um, or you fall off the wagon, so to speak, remember who and whose you are in Christ. One mistake doesn't mean that you're out forever. You also need to remember what Christ has done for you and the fact that you are deeply loved for loved and valued, and you're worth it. Operating from a place like this, ultimately your purpose in Christ, is like standing on solid ground. It's from a place of strength. 
In Luke 15, 4 through, uh, 4 through 7, it tells us, Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven, in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not repent or do not need to repent. Some words that stuck out there for me um, weren't sinner or repent, but were actually joyful, joyfully and rejoice. So he wasn't angrily or doing something out of, out of obligation or having to punish the sheep or anything like that. He didn't sigh and say, oh, it's you again. Um, and, and E-W-W or Y-O-U, you works both ways, right? Um, he didn't do any of those things. Instead, you know, he, he went after this one and rejoiced and he was joyful. So if you ever, again, fall off the wagon, I want you to know God's response is joy and rejoicing to have you back. So all 100 sheep, they are important, right? But it's often the case that the one who wanders off feels like they're not. But that's so far from the case. If that's you today, I want you to take a moment to really think and consider who Christ is and what he sacrificed for you. That he died for you so that you can experience new life with him now and also eternal life with him later. Remember what God has called you to, and that you have been saved with a purpose. However, sometimes knowing where we need to go is the easy part, and figuring out our first steps or the steps to take every day um, is actually the daunting task that might then uh, stop us in our tracks. It just seems like too much of, a, of an issue, so we're not even going to start. So I'm pretty sure Nehemiah, though, he didn't wake up every single day during his role as governor with a clear plan or itinerary from God where God said, behold, eat this for breakfast. You know, I, I'm not sure if that really happened for Nehemiah. Um, although, speaking of breakfast, his call did inform him on what he would then eat for breakfast. And, so, and I'm saying that because last week, if you remember, Pastor Rob, he noted that Nehemiah was unwilling to take the food that he was owed by the people uh, from the people. And so uh, his calling then informed him what he should do. And so that's kind of how this thing, I think, typically works. I haven't really experienced where God led me to A, B, C, D, and E. But instead, my calling then informed what the next step was that I needed to take. So he had this general calling to rebuild the wall. But all of his actions leading up to this moment came from his experience and who he was as a person and as a follower of God. His integrity and his consistency informed him of what he should do next. And so as God led, as God led Nehemiah was then able to follow so in your own life today, it may be that God is calling you or leading you into a specific direction. And for some of us, that might be as clear as day. Others, it might more so have the consistency of mud. But for both, we can follow Nehemiah's example. So be consistent in your walk and in your faith, and then joyfully take the next step. Another thing that Nehemiah did was he, he prayed. He recognized that he was not in control, that he could not do this on his own, that he faced insurmountable odds with enemies all around him. They were consistently eating away at his resolve, and so what did he do? He took a moment, he prayed. He gave it to God, he put it in God's hands. In verse 9 we read, They were all trying to frighten us, thinking, Their hands will get too weak for the work, and it will not be completed. But I prayed, Now strengthen my hands or literally, to cause my hands to become strong. We all know, that we all know this kind of weakness. Uh, when we aren't strong enough to go on, it has nothing to do with endurance or physical ability. It's, it's, it's mental, it's emotional, it's personal. The issue really wouldn't have been their hands here. Low morale can make or break the, the strongest army or make the, the best team lose. And so they needed God to then give them strength. And we see this throughout Scripture. And you'll notice in these verses that I'm going to read um, that it mentions uh, hands quite a, quite a lot. And uh, what stuck out to me in these verses as I was reading these was uh, God could have snapped his fingers. He could have just said something. Um, but God used his hands. And to me, that kind of says that as God steps into my life, he likes to get his hands dirty. He's involved. But read these verses with me. In Psalm 63, my soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. In Psalm 37, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. 
Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. In Isaiah 41.10 we read, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So God was a right-handed batter, apparently. Uh, Then in Psalm 139, verse 10, Even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. And then in Psalm 95, 5, The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. So again, God could have snapped his fingers or done anything else, but instead he got his hands dirty uh, with his people. And I think God's willing to be involved, and God has demonstrated that uh, in my life as well. But reading these verses and studying Nehemiah's story, it gives a sense of, of peace. If God can handle all of these issues, if God can move world politics to support his people in a way that those leaders making these decisions had no idea how they were falling into line, but they were just doing it, if God can do that, then God can handle whatever I'm facing today. And he also has the strength to pull things through and to strengthen my hands as well. So when these things happen, when you go through circumstances that we're talking about today, are you relying on God? Are you giving God the glory, the work, the success, the fear, the fear of failure? Are you giving these things to him? So at the hospital where I'm a chaplain, I kind of walk into a lot of unknown situations. I have a fancy pager and it just says, come to the emergency department or room two or ICU or something like that. And I'm kind of walking into the unknown. So I kind of, uh, um, the prayer I say the most is help. That prayer says all I need to say and it says more. Help. So if you're here today and you don't know where to start with prayer, I would say perhaps basic is best. Maybe your prayer, like mine, is help. You know, my four-year-old, he demands before dinner that, he, that uh, um, he's the one that prays before we eat. He, if you pray before we eat, it's not supposed to happen. He's supposed to do it. And his prayer every single time is, thank you, Jesus, amen. You know, and... Uh, he kind of, he, he says the right thing, he says enough, and that's what it's been now for at least a year or so. Thank you, Jesus, amen. But prayer is a two-way street, it's a two-way conversation. Like any relationship, our relationship with God needs communication. So if you don't know where to start today, or, um, uh, or you don't know the next step to take, um, I have three suggestions here then today. And you can look these up when you go home or sometime this week. But uh, the first two are acronyms, ACTS and PRAY. They kind of just offer a roadmap of kind of where to start, what to do, what to say. So if you don't know where to go, start there. That's just a good piece of advice. Um, The final one is not just examine, it's the prayer of examine. And so basically this is a prayer, um, uh, um, kind of a a guy named, it's called the Ignatian Prayer of Examine. A guy named Ignatius, he came up with it and it's a prayer of examine. Um, But this basically helps you at the end of your day to examine when you felt closest and furthest from God. So when you stop to prayerfully consider, consider uh, where you felt closest to God, the idea is that perhaps God is calling you more into that direction. And where you felt furthest from God, start moving away from that direction as you prayerfully then consider your next day. And so um, uh, if you Google Fuller Studio and then Prayer of Examine, that'll bring you to um, a, a, an 18 minute video that really goes over this prayer well. And um, it's a good place to get started, again, if you're not sure where to go. So if life is good now, my suggestion to you is to pray. If life is hard, if life is easy, my suggestion to you is to pray. Prayer is so much more than simply asking for things. Uh, Like, you know, it's not a vending machine, right? So um, when my youngest son, when he was in the hospital for about a month, I became what I call a vending machine consultant. I just knew where the best snacks were and on which floor. But prayer is so much, than, so much more than just asking for something. It's a, it's a communication style. It's a way to keep a relationship going. So my suggestion to you at all times is to pray. When we feel challenged or pressed on all sides, like Nehemiah, use prayer then as a source of strength. And finally, Nehemiah trusted God with the outcome. In verse 14 we read, Remember Tobiah and Sanballat, my God, because of what they have done. Remember also the prophet, prophet Nodiah and how she and the rest of the prophets have been trying to intimidate me. Now, you might think that Nehemiah is out for revenge, and maybe he is. Maybe he's only asking God to remember these things and the things that people have done to him. Either way, what he's doing here, which you can see, is that he's releasing his grip, and he's then trusting God with the outcome. 
He is freeing himself of the negativity and the pain associated with keeping a grudge. Where a grudge is really kind of poisonous, right? Um, when you're holding on to it, it's not hurting the other person, it's hurting you. If Nehemiah took revenge, if he got, if he got consumed by it, this would have gotten in the way of rebuilding the wall. It would have gotten in the way of his consistency and God's calling for his life. It would have given his enemies the result they were looking for anyway. If you stop building the wall and fight me, you stop building the wall, I win. Uh, so what Nehemiah needed to do was let go of the outcome and give it to God. But so often we get consumed by our need to control or to get even, something that just, it just festers in us. We relive what we should have said over and over again. I mean, we have our best comebacks in the shower later that night, right? At least that's what I do. Um, but, but in those moments, that person's not listening to me. I can't, I don't really have any contact. You probably shouldn't, you know. Um, but uh, if they're wanting to hurt me or to take up space in my head or mess with me, the only way to not let that happen is to not let that happen. So my encouragement for you today is to do the brave thing and to trust God with the outcome. Do what you need to do, stay consistent, do your part, and trust God through that whole process. You'll find when you do that, a lot of that might look like forgiveness. Matthew 18, 21 through 22 tells us, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. So in other words, a lot of times. And so you'll, you'll notice when you read in the Bible, it, it'll, also have, it'll have like a footnote, and it could be 70 times 7. Some, ver, some translations say 70 times 7, some, ta, some say 77. That's because it's kind of written the same in Greek, and it could be either one. But either way, having a 7 and a 7 next to each other, or 70 times 7, it kind of still gets to the same point. Uh, we often look at what Peter was doing with the standard to forgive somebody in the Old Testament was 3. And so he's doubling it, then adding one. Like, I'm being really good here, right, Jesus? And Jesus says, well, almost. Um, but he adds, a 70, he, had, <clears throat> excuse me, he adds a 70 to that. And that's significant. That's significant because the, another, the number 70, it represents the um, time that people were in captivity. From the dis destruction of Jerusalem to them being hauled off in slavery, or the, the brightest and best go off to Babylon, the rest get killed. And uh, the city is left in ruins. It uh, demarks the time from the temple, from the time the first temple was destroyed to when they were building the second temple. And so what Jesus is actually doing here, he's saying, yeah, uh, multiply it by two, then add one, but then take that and multiply that by this whole experience, this terrible event in everybody's past, something unforgivable. Multiply it by that, and then you've done enough. And that just, that's hit, that hits different more than just, 77 or 490 or 7 times 70 or anything like that. It's, it's, it's that emotional thing, the root, the, something that's just in the root of who you are that is just uh, um, unspeakable, uh, a harm that was against you. Forgive that times 7. That's what Jesus is saying here to Peter. So back to my days in the nursing home, to tell you the truth, it was a little defeating. I graduated from seminary, I had just gotten married, and instead of landing a ministry job that I could call my career, I needed a whole other full-time job just to get by, working 60 to 70 hours a week. I'm taking lunch orders for someone who literally couldn't remember what they had for breakfast. And I have this lady then trying to dump her job on me, and is now lying about me behind my back. But looking back, and I'm still pretty young, so I'm not looking back that far, I'm the one that won in that situation. Um, I was blessed to know those people, those residents, those families in the nursing home. Uh, God used that to direct my life. Little did I know that God was involved and God had a plan. It was just one that disagreed with mine, if I was to tell you the truth. God used that time to lead me in the way or to where he was leading me. And if I didn't have those experiences, if I didn't have those roadblocks, and if I didn't meet those wonderful people, I would not be who I am today. So if you stay consistent, if you go to God in prayer and commit these things and these circumstances in your life to him, and you trust God with the outcome, I want you to know life isn't going to be perfect. It might not even go all that well. That's kind of the promise. It's like, and you follow me and life may not go well, but that's the promise. Um, but what, you will, what will happen, though, you'll be living a life of obedience, 
And you'll be playing your part in God's perfect plan and God's timing for what God is up to in the world. And what else could that be but success? Let's pray together. Merciful God, I thank you for the example of Nehemiah and, and his people, of your people, and how we are your people today. We thank you that you care deeply about the smallest detail of our lives to the biggest thing going on in the world right now and more. We thank you that all these things are equally in your hands and that you have the capability and the power and the interest. As you guide us, Lord, as we willingly follow, may we have the courage to willingly follow. Bless us in these ways, we pray. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.